everybody, and welcome to the second edition of Formidable Fridays, the making of a new kind of classical play festival. I am the artistic director of Shadow Path. My name is Alex Caroli, and I am also the host of this event this evening. Before we dive into question number one for our brainstormers, I will pass it over to Misa, our associate producer, for a land acknowledgement. Hi, everybody. We wanted to acknowledge the land as the Indigenous people would acknowledge it. So this is the Native American Ten Commandments. The earth is our mother. Care for her. Honor your relations. Open your heart and soul to the great spirit. All life is sacred. Treat all beings with respect. Take from the earth what is needed and nothing more. Do what needs to be done for the good of all. Give constant thanks to the great spirit for each new day. Speak the truth, but only of, of good in others. Follow the rhythms of nature. Rise and retire with the sun. Enjoy life's journey, but leave no tracks. Thank you, Misa. So at Shadow Path, we have the privilege to be working on a new kind of classical play festival for 2021. And we call it a new kind of classical play festival because all of the playwrights are women. And because we want to best serve the needs of women artists, we wanted to tap directly into the source, hence the collective brain of the brainstormers. So amongst us here this evening, we have quite an array of different artistic disciplines from playwrights to performers, to producers, to directors, to storytellers, to comedians, to arts managers, to filmmakers, to founders, and the list goes on. So we are pulling from many different areas of expertise. So with that being said, I am happy to jump in to question number one. Brainstormers, are you ready? <clears throat> question number one. How can we leverage a classical play festival to build continuing opportunities for female artists? I'll take a swing at that, Alex. Um, I would say, I like what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing, putting female voices in these festivals. So not just as writers and playwrights, but let's hear from the directors and the costuming and the SM design and lighting design and prop masters and producers and your committee and every single role that requires like a play to run, put females in those seats. And let's just see how amazingly that show will turn out, right? Um, Another suggestion I thought of was have like a best of like award ceremony after the festivals and recognize that outstanding work and and people can leverage that for continued work. So it could be like via a committee or through like nominations or a jury that you have seeing like every play and everything. Um, yeah, and highlight them on your website after the fact and maybe privately like invite industry folks to come and see the shows, like people who have hiring bodies within um, their theater company. I think those are all ways that we can leverage this festival to continue work for um, female artists. I might jump in there because uh, I think some of my thoughts align with yours too. Um, I, my background, I come from a very uh, community programming um, and outreach background uh, in a lot of the work that I do. And so I was uh, thinking about that as a way to uh, leverage the festival and how can we sort of think about the festival as, you know, something that happens today, but, you know, has like a legacy that continues on and, and where the work that happens at the festival sort of translates into something else or something more for the the women um, and the folks who are participating in the festival. And so to your point, T, I think um, you had mentioned bringing in like the, you know, 
other ADs and, and producers to come and watch the work. And I think that's really important. I would echo that. I think it's creating a space for the artists that are going to be performing um, or showcasing at the festival to also have a networking opportunity in a way. And I hate using that word. It's a little bit of an icky word for me, but in a way it's having like a networking opportunity where uh, it might translate to more jobs, more opportunities post this festival. So it's not just creating opportunity with the festival, it's creating opportunities post. Um, and another thing I was thinking about was how do we sort of archive the festival as well? Um, because I think that's important. Um, and maybe others have better ideas, but my first thought is like, how do we get the right critics at the festival? So they're writing about the shows that are happening. Um, and I say the right critics, cause you know, you want, um, you know, female identifying writers to be writing about the shows um, that are happening at the festival and, and the artists that are on stage. And so getting the right critics out, um, maybe there are other suggestions on how we can best archive and, and sort of have this legacy of the festival. But those are some thoughts that I had around how to leverage it um, as a whole. Um, I would like to jump in on, on both of those things. Um, I, I think that, uh, that a lot of this, it, it would be, um, I'm thinking about the importance of, of talkbacks after the, um, the performances where, where, where people can come in and talk about how these plays are, are relevant also now and, and like how things really haven't, um, how things have, have, have uh, stayed the same and changed. And also um, to, to, to do, because we've, as we've been talking about these, we talk about how um, the different plays can be interpreted in different ways. I'd like to see different um, directors tackle the same play. Oh, like, you know, so have a night where the same play is done one, two, three, four times with different directors, different casts, um, and, and see how it, how it evolves and how it's different. And, and, and you give lots of different artists an opportunity to play with the same work. I think that's brilliant. Like, I think the idea of doing this play four times with four different directors and four casts is so incredible because we can have casts from different walks of life and like lived experiences and their interpretations of these shows. And then having each of them have a space to talk back with the audience um, and having that space of just like creative energy and figuring out what still exists as problems for women today. and what have we moved forward from and how much have we moved forward right and have we moved forward at all like I think is a big question I think our problems still remain the same they're just masked in different discourses and narratives um so I I think that's brilliant and going off of what was said earlier about the archives like can the actors and the creators and the women in these projects be the archive themselves can they be writing pieces of reflection while they're working on these projects, through, like while they're working on the festival. Um, and can those personal narratives be a part of the archive of the show? I would also suggest um, having in intersectional feminism and Black and Indigenous and POC um, representation reflection being absolutely woven into the narrative and the fabric and the framework as to how festivals are made. Um, everything from the, the people who hire, the people who are behind the scenes, on the stage, even so much as when you go and do advertising and promotion, like where you promote and where you advertise, because that in and of itself is outreach. And it means that particular persons will get to see an advertisement of the show that wouldn't normally consider themselves to be a theater person or a theater woman and wouldn't think that they're allowed to be in that room or go to that space. And so I think it involves all of that and having an intentional intersectional feminism and, and an intention to represent and include um, black and women of color is a huge part of that because it means that so many different people know that they are allowed to be in that space and they're allowed to be part of those stories. And I think part that's a huge part of that is people aren't going to go to places they don't feel safe going to and they're not going to try to go to theater or shows or events where they don't see someone in any capacity that looks like them. And so having that be in the forefront or one of the top priorities of planning and creation, I think is important. Going off of that, I, I think also when, when like when I hear the word classical play, I 
as an immigrant and English is not my first language, it's scary to me because that means that the language might not be a, an English that I understand, an English that is really far removed from what I learn. Uh, and, and thinking about what is a classical play in a way that it, what is a classical play to you and what is a classical play to other people from different communities. Like what is the classical work I'm bringing and how can I share the, the history or the stories that I have known that now have become classics to new audiences. I think there's, there's a lot of ways to play with the word classical play and for who is what is classical. And also I always question is like, what makes something classic? Is it time? Is it how great it is? Is it because a bunch of white men sat down and said so? Like, it, what, like what is it? Uh, because I think when you start questioning first, what is a classical play? Then we can actually start reinventing what, what you want your festival to be when you say this word. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll chime in on that. Just to answer that question, uh, in our definition of classical plays, it is based on time. And the time frame that we are using is from the 10th century to 1950. And now I understand that traditionally 1950 uh, and the 1900s are not considered classical theater, but for our purposes and also to represent more earlier female voices, we wanted to extend it into the 1900s. Um, so for our purposes, classical theater is based on time. Um, I'll also just maybe share my own opinions of, of, I think that, can you imagine out of all those suggestions that we just heard across the board, if uh, this classical play festival encompassed all of that, like what, what an enriching, amazing kind of experience that would be. Uh, it just is very exciting to, to hear about all these different thoughts and approaches to, to classical theater and to a festival format. One thing I was thinking about is how do we leverage um, this kind of opportunity to continue more opportunities is to look at other uh, spaces or theater stages, because I don't know where this is going to be staged. It might be everyday spaces. It might be in theaters. It might be online. But let's just say that it's in person for the sake of this argument. Um, wouldn't it be interesting to present um, these plays and to have them tour so that they have a continued lifespan in another space. It could be in the next town. It could be from York region to Toronto. It, hey, it could be across Canada if the funders and the funding is in place. But I think that um, too often in theater, it's uh, the moment is missed, you know, like there might be uh, one or two uh, nights, uh, maybe a weekend of being able to catch this experience. Um, but why not extend that to other spaces and have the show or the festival tour on? That was my thoughts about how we can continue leveraging and providing more opportunities for the artists that are working in this festival. Any, um, so uh, any other further or final or continuing thoughts about this before we jump into our second question? Yes, Misa. Um, I love that thought about the um, touring. Um, the other thing was, although most, uh, the majority of the plays that we looked at were very Euro Eurocentric, we are making a point of, of searching out playwrights from as from other country, female playwrights from other countries too, and and it's it's not their tradition. A, lo a lot of time we're finding there were oral traditions or 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 or, or the like this kind of um, structured theater, but we have found some, and it's so exciting to find like a Spanish playwright or or a Chinese playwright or a Japanese playwright, like older by time wise and we go wow that's really cool and and i think like that's one of the cool things about this is is that we can showcase those voices that you're saying i don't know if they're there or not because they are there and to be able to showcase them can i add something um so you did alex you did like a monologue slam recently right something like that um 
to go off of what Monica was saying earlier about like English not being their second language or being their second language and 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 it's classical uh, the English that you know they'll understand. Can we bring in like a monologue, uh, like a show that is just showcasing monologues of BIPOC artists, second generation artists, new Canadians, and show their work and show like works from you know their native tongue and and particularly indigenous um, art as well and storytelling. I think that would be a good show that you could put. I know it's not um, a female playwright or maybe it is, but you know, we can discuss that. I think that would be a cool idea. I love that we can talk, so we're just like, <laughs> uh, super quick. I think talking about leverage, I think things like this, this is how you leverage your festival, like literally putting people together and, and bouncing ideas of like, like I didn't know how classical things were like in, in this company, how you like say like, oh, this is a classical play, but now I understand. And also the thing you said about touring and everything people have been saying, uh, I, I did this show with Aluna Theater and we made sure that we did the show in English and Spanish. And the audiences were amazed because we were like, hey, if you don't completely understand, we got you. But I think we can even push it a little bit more that is like, hey, what, like, Dainty is an amazing burlesque, burlesque artist, creator, like, why don't we adapt one to a burlesque show? And why don't we adapt the same show to a comedy show? And what, like, literally moving things forward and not, not only in like, yes, lang like language, we can play so much with language, like mm, language is beautiful. But if there is not one language that we can understand, use your body, like there's other ways. So I think having this discussion and having this uh, d different people from different medias is like great way to leverage. And just to add on to that, like I'm thinking about the politics of having a racialized body playing a story that is white. Like how does this story change? Um, how is it interpreted in a different lens and how are the lines read in a different way? Like I think going back to Misa's idea of having four shows of the same script, like if you had an, like an all black cast or an all Asian cast and just seeing the different ways that that story comes to life with the infusion of culture and lived experience, I think can be like a, a beautiful rendition of what it is to be a woman in all of these different walks of life, if that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. And the more the more that this comes up, because this has come up before where we've talked about one play, but having, let's say, three different directors with three different casts, with three different uh, perspectives on what the story is trying to say. And the more I think about this, I think it's a very interesting way to present works in general, but especially a classical play festival. Um, also, uh, you know, looking at artists with disabilities is something that we want to start doing more. And what if we had a cast that was all directed by artists with disabilities and what, what that lived experience is, is how that looks different. Um, I think that there's so many different perspectives and to give one play only one opportunity is almost, uh, it was just so limiting, right? Especially, especially today now with, with so much diversity. Um, any other final thoughts before we move into question number? Yeah, I just want to say to just to quickly add to that to say that the world was really always diverse. And so there's always been black women and women of color and trans women and queer people and, and fat bodies. And um, there, there have always been, the world really always looked like this. It's just that theater and, and particularly classic theater or particular works of, of storytelling didn't always reflect that. And so I think essentially it, it's, it's almost like the reverse or the inverse in which um, classical art or classical theater or fine art or high art um, essentially catches up with what the world has already been. And if we can continue that and make that remake traditions where the traditions reflect the reality of the world um, with multiple voices and multiple viewpoints, then I think that would be really beautiful. I think tradition in and of itself is actually quite gorgeous. I'm, I'm actually a bit of a traditionalist myself, but I think that it's always good to remake a tradition. So that way it's stronger. Yes, excellent. Okay, 
brainstormers, we are off to a great start. And actually, some of what has been already said really applies to our second and last question. Um, but let's see what else comes from it. So moving on into our final question, <clears throat> how can we best present classical works for contemporary audiences? As we know, classical theater, you know, has been very limiting and um, it can also be very triggering. And we have um, chatted a lot about whether we leave these works um, in place, like the integrity of the, of the works without editing them, without any dramaturgy, or whether we edit them to suit uh, the sensitivities of today's contemporary audiences. So those are just some thoughts, but I will leave it up to the brainstormers to discuss. First of all, I think you have to um, really rem remind people that theater is good. So as, as a theater artist and a live performer, like uh, as someone who is an actor and a playwright, but then also I'm someone who is a cabaret performer and a burlesque performer, I, I have met and encountered so many people who say things like, oh, I'm not smart enough for that. Or like, isn't that too she-she or foo-foo or fancy or, you know, no, I'm not like, I'm just like, you know, uh, trash, like I'm not cool, classy enough for that environment. And so I think part of that is how do we make theater, just like you would make revolution or politics irresistible, how do you make theater irresistible? So that the anyone from a working class, low income sex worker slash punk rock slash super tattooed from head to toe um, slash non-binary queer to someone who is incredibly um, intelligent and from a well-to-do background and highly educated that both of those persons know that they are allowed to go to a theater, go to a theater space and see a classic play. I think that's a really in, important in, thing to, to think about in terms of how we continue to make theater relevant, re, uh, relevant particularly as the audience is now spoiled you know we have inter we have the internet we have streaming sites we have netflix and hulu and all these different ways to get immediate um, entertainment and immediate stories and immediate consumption. And so people aren't going to go to see theater unless they think there's something exciting or interesting happening there. And they think that they are, it's okay for them to be there. And so that means again, diversifying your casting, you know, casting artists and performers that Pete, someone who wouldn't go to a theater play would go because they like that performer. I cannot tell you how many times I've watched maybe an okay television show or a movie that's not quite great, but I really like the actor in it and I want to see what he or she does. And so I show up to watch this thing. The same goes with theater. And I think broadening the scope is to I mean, I know it's Shakespeare, but broadening the scope as to who would play Lady Macbeth could be really revolutionary in that, is it a Black trans woman? Is, is it a queer woman? Is it a, is a Black woman or a woman of color? Um, is it someone who's from a multidisciplinary background? Being able to do things like that really brings in a diverse audience. And so, so I think that's a really big part of it. And another part is advertising again and promoting in, in places that the theater world would necessarily think would be interested. And so, you know, having outreach in, in bars and venues and cabaret clubs and, and punk rock clubs and such like that, where you say, we have a theater show, we have a play coming up and we, you know, you invite people from that space to be in that space. I think outreach into spaces and places that wouldn't normally be thought of or considered would also be something to think about in terms of that. That was awesome. I love that. Um, I answered this question from more of like an actor perspective. Uh, that's what I was able to bring to the table. So um, for me, I always like enjoy the early stages of a play where it's like table read style discussions and like experimental movement as your character and like finding the essence of the work um, and answering what what is the body of work saying and and what translates through the ages because act actors often um, dive deep into character work like well before rehearsals start so have these really informal rehearsals almost like workshop style where like it's not about like knowing your lines but it's more about knowing your character and knowing the voices, because that's like invaluable to the process, right? So if you know the voice 
of the work, if you know what the themes are, the, the director has a lot to work with in terms of how they're able to, to present these themes to newer audiences. Cause that's, you know, when we relate to something that's, uh, it doesn't matter if it's classical or if it's contemporary, right? Uh, so if those themes are carrying forward, we can we can just relate to that story. Um, and also, Alex, I really liked what you did after the AGM where you had a workshop after. Um, my sister who doesn't really like do these kinds of workshops stayed on uh, and did the entire workshop. So I feel like maybe we could start implementing those in specific shows that would be relevant to the show. I think also something that keeps popping up into my head is the idea of music. And maybe it's because I think music sets the tone for what we're doing. So like, what if we were to use or focus, like what if we were doing a classical show and the undertone of the show was on a hip hop beat? Like what would happen if it was on a classical Indian Kathak beat? What would happen if it was on a salsa beat? And that was like the tone through which we were entering this artistically, right? Like what happens to the show then? Right, and like that also targets specific audiences. It makes it more inclusive. Um, and then being site specific, like why don't we do work in subway stations or in bars where classical theater is inaccessible? Like we always have to go to like the Soul Peppers or like places like that to see classical works. But like, I wanna walk in the park and see a whole bunch of people doing a classical show to a hip hop beat. Hell yeah, I'm gonna come by and watch what's going on. Cause that's throwing me off first of all as an audience member. And then I'm engaged right away. So I think there's like a, a beauty in the fusion um, and the confusion. And I think that is something that I'd love to see personally. Um, when, uh, when Alex was talking about, uh, do we leave these, because these, these places, some of them are kind of not inaccessible, but difficult. And, and the question was, do we just leave them or do we, uh, touch them and and I used to be all on leave it it's a, it's a classical thing you don't touch art that's art and I have changed my mind because um our time is not their time people now don't sit through three hour plays easily they don't want to hear monologues that go on for a day they want to get to the point in out thank you <laughs> not always but but a lot of times so I think that um a lot of these plays can be cut down they can we can do we can do excerpts, but the other thing is um, is uh, is to is to I, I thought it would be very cool because because issues are are so much the same. It would be very cool to have theme nights where we're going to look at how how a playwright thought about um, children born out of wedlock, how they thought how they thought about women who aren't appreciated for their talents, who are, are lesser than men. Who are being paid different, like all the same issues now that were that were an it that was an issue in 1500, 1600, 1800, and take because it's the same issue over and over and over and over, and put them together. So like here I see this issue from this time to this time to this time to this time, and now, and I think that contemporary audiences will go, whoa, look, it's me then, it's me now, and and I think bringing them together like that is is how you make it relevant for um, contemporary audiences. I think if, you're, if, you're, if we're gonna do like different nights and something about like what Dainty was saying is like, then do Q and A's with you, do a BIPOC night, do a queer night, do a newcomers night. Like I understand like when what Dainty was saying is like, there's so many theaters, not even until now that the pandemic has put some of their like stuff there that I feel that I can go. Like I never said food and I'm not gonna say names in some places because I was like, why? I'm that, that's not me. I don't I didn't go to theater school in, in Toronto, so maybe nobody will know me. So it's this things of like just have a night where you can invite people who might feel that there's not a place, but not only that, have a QA, have a workshop. Um I've done many workshops where it's not only youth and it's youth and elders. Like there's so many older people, like older people out there that they want to see theater but they also don't feel welcome like it's there are so many ways to uh have that gap but it's not only inviting people it's having a conversation it's always you take a step we take a step now what we do 
Um, so I think, yeah, something like that. And also talking about like accessibility, now that we have this with the pandemic and people that are not able to attend the theaters or not able to attend the shows, let's do one live stream, a season, a show, and invite people who can can actually access most of the theaters in the, in like, not even the city, in the world. So, yeah. I, sorry, I'm trying, trying to get my, get mute to work. I got it. Okay. I, I really love what Monica said. And um, I think accessibility is really important. So even having accessible ticket prices, because that's another barrier is that people think they can't afford to go, um, not just in terms of intelligence or um, academic background or highly educated background, but also just can I afford the ticket price to go. And so having um, price ranges or discounts, that's always encouraging. I also think having the surprise of having a really classic play at a place where where no one would expect it, like somewhere like um, the Bovine Club on, uh, I think it's called the Bovine Sex Club on, on Queen Street or Sinful Sundays slash Cherry Colas, which is at Queen as well, which is um, a cabaret slash rock and roll um, bar. It's the surprise element of knowing that, because one thing I do realize, and or sorry, have come to realize is that if you build it, people will come. And, but part of it is that there has to be a welcoming environment where a person feels that they, again, are allowed to come. Um, and also casting plays a big part as well. Again, I mean, I, I'm i gonna go see a classic play that I know that artist, isn't she that, that stripper slash actor slash, didn't she do that weird thing one year with her vagina? Like, I, I you know what I mean? But now she's playing this classic character. How does she do that? And so I think really being able to take away a kind of um, casting elitism around who looks like what in terms of classic theater and classic storytelling would really go a long way. But people wanna see someone that they relate to. Um, they wanna see someone that they understand. And even if you take reflection out of it in a particular way, I have definitely related to a character on stage or in a film that doesn't look like me, but I understand her. I understand her in terms of the writing and the acting and, and the casting. Even if I'm looking at a blonde white woman, but she, she is playing a particular character with a with a kind of groundedness and sensitivity that speaks to me it speaks to some of my lived experiences and so I think all of those things come to play come into play in terms of accessibility and invitation and, ex and inclusion and so those are things to think about as well is um, producing and having shows in places that wouldn't normally be considered acceptable, um, having different times as well, an early show and then a later show. Again, um, having the price be a reasonable and accessible and so folks feel that they can afford to go. All of those things, um, again, you, I think Monica mentioned it, the talk back, all of those things make a huge part in terms of folks being able to because people want to ask artists questions you'd be surprised if you if there's a talk back after a play people will stay because they're interested or they're curious and they never got to ask before they didn't know because you know there's a lot of mystery around artists and performers <laughs> you know they sort we seem to for some reason exist with a kind of a foot of um you like you're not you're from the ether you're not from here from a different dimension and you just appear on the stage and then you, you, you do the performance and then you leave you're not really earthy or grounded and so talkbacks are really great for that too because of the audience member someone could have gone to your play or seen you perform many many times and you didn't know that because they they don't think that they can stay or they feel embarrassed about what they're allowed to say in a space but so talkbacks are really good for that too I love that idea of a pay what you can night. That's so awesome. I, yeah. Um, Alex, the workshop that you do, um, you know, the, where, where uh, people can volunteer to read a line or like a, a character and we like in the, like the winery in the woods, like we do those. Um, that would be so cool after a play to see a play and then take like a scene from that play and have audience members afterwards, like say, come up and do the scene with everyone, like in the, uh, with the audience still there in their seats, like that would be so fun and interactive. So I think anything interactive, like the Q and A's, like you guys said, um, would be really fun. If I could maybe add one thing, but I think everyone has said things so beautifully. Um, I think 
hearing from everyone, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, it's gonna have to, I think, come down to how we market it really. And I know Dainty had mentioned this a lot as well about marketing and who we're speaking to. And I think it's really understanding the different audiences because I think there are so many different types of audiences that we'll be speaking to with this festival, understanding who they are and understanding what will bring them in and making sure that that marketing material is accessible to them, is uh, relatable to them. Um, and so when I'm thinking of classical theater, um, I don't know if I want a traditional like, in 1995, or no, that's not even classical in like 1895, um, you know, such and such lady lord and blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know if I want to read that in a playbill or in an advertisement. I want the essence of what the show is about um, and why, why it's relevant to me today. Uh, so really thinking about that messaging. And I do think that messaging also puts a barrier. So just, again, watching that wording um it's not accessible to a lot of people to to read just a plain old english old english you know summary um of a of a play so keeping that in mind as well when we're uh, putting out marketing can i just add like i love that like what if a theme or a thematic question would be like is feminism still relevant in 2020 today like something like that you know like something that like obviously we're all kind of like well yeah but for so many, it's a provocative question because there's such an intergenerational gap within families, especially in the diaspora as well. And like, what if our marketing was in different languages to target specific communities? So it was accessible to them so that when you go into a specific community, they're like, oh, I can read that. Um, but then it'd also be about how do we bridge the gap between that marketing and what we're putting on stage so those people could also feel included. Um, but yeah, I 100% agree with what was just said in terms of marketing. Cool, that's great. Um, wow, we are almost uh, out of time. Does anyone have any final thoughts or comments um, with anything that has been said? I'll just say uh, just some things that, that I wrote down. Uh, so yes, I think regardless, uh, it's gonna be, there is gonna be some virtual programming next year. Uh, Ideally, it will be a hybrid of in-person and virtual programming. We just don't really know if that's, you know, possible to do the in-person programming. Um, I love this idea of the music. And I was thinking like a Shadow Path playlist kind of over, over the repertoire of some classical pieces that we select and, and what that playlist would look like to support the, the classical material. I think it's such an interesting juxtaposition to really start to make people think about these or classical works a little bit differently because they can be a little bit out of range for, for you know, most people actually as has come up. Um, I love the idea of thinking about space, how, where, we, where we place these uh, works, these classical works and how that affects how they're received and how people can access those spaces. Um, and then everything around marketing and uh, pay what you can and, multilingual and I think it's all just extremely uh, relevant and fascinating and it's actually surprising um, that it's not being done more often because look at the enthusiasm and the excitement when we start to look at classical works in context like this mm -hmm. so um, what can I say we, we've done it that was a really excellent sort of short and sweet I thank you all for being here this evening and for sharing your ideas and sharing the space together. And yes, Deanna, I'm going to say it, a little bit of networking has also been done, which, um, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. I think networking is also going to be a part of this festival, but maybe we will find a better expression for it. Um, so thank you everybody and until next time let's uh keep the conversation going but also more importantly let's actually put it into action thank you everyone have a lovely evening bye